Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 143. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Pudbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. January's prize is a fabulous Tudor gift package containing lots of Tudor-themed goodies, including the book I created with Catherine Holman, Colouring History, The Tudors. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. Next week, I'll be chatting to Sandra Vasoli and James Peacock about the ways in which Elizabeth I honoured her mother's memory. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTutors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about the John Blank Project is Michael Ohajuru. Michael is a senior fellow of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. He blogs, writes, and speaks regularly on the black presence in Renaissance Europe, and has spoken at the National Gallery, Tate Britain, British Library, National Archives, and the Victoria Albert Museum. Michael has been featured in TV programs on the BBC, ITV, and Channel 5. He's the founder of Image of the Black in London Galleries, a series of gallery tours, the project director and chief evangelist of the John Blank Project, an art and archive project celebrating John Blank, the black trumpeter to the courts of Henry VII and Henry VIII. He's also co-convener of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, What's Happening in Black British History series of workshops, and founder member of the Black Presence in British Portraiture Network. Today's musical interlude was contributed to the John Blank Project by the composer and performer Randolph Matthews. To find out more about his work, please visit (laughs) randolphmatthews.co.uk.
Welcome to Talking Tudors, Michael. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Very well indeed, Natalie. Oh, fantastic. And I suppose a good place to start would be you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm, I'm, 70, I'm 70 this year. I'm retired. Uh, I've retired from a career in communications. I started back in the 1980s when it was all data communications and I finished with the mobile internet. And that, that, that's all, that sounds like a different planet now. But now I've got two degrees. My first degree was physics, 19, 19, 1974, like, again, another planet to go. And that, and, and that was the center of my, my career, communications. But I did, I did an open university art history degree in 2008, kind of prepared me for my, like, almost like a second career. Because what I do now since I've been retired, I kind of follow two things, two routes. One, I try and give back you know, to the, to the community. I do work with, with disadvantaged boys and girls, you know, helping them to be the best they can. And also I follow my, my passion in the Black Presence and Renaissance art, which, um, which brings us what, what we're here to, to discuss today, John Blank. Absolutely, John Blank. we are. Blank. We're going to talk about the John Blank project. So I suppose it's a good, good time to ask you, what is this project all about and how did it come about? Now, I'm going to take a deep breath. How long have we got? No, <laughs> no, that's a great question. Well, the project came about from my studying the Black presence in, in Renaissance art. And there was two figures we studied extensively then. There's many hundreds of them. One is the Black Magus, the Black King and the Adoration scene. There's literally hundreds, maybe perhaps thousands of this image. And, and St. And Saint Morris, the, Blacks, the, the Black uh, Roman centurion. Again, hundreds, perhaps not as many as the King, but certainly hundreds of that image. But neither of those characters existed. They're complete fictions. They're fabrications. They're built on an idea and an image, an artistic practice. And they have culture, they have cultural, religious, and some political political significance. And, and, and that's what I studied in my art history, the background to, to those figures. But as I say, they didn't exist. And I was working with Miranda Kaufman, Dr. Miranda Kaufman, on a thing called Image and Reality, the Black Presence in Renaissance Europe. Miranda did the um, the reality. She studied as part of a PhD many many hundreds of black, uh, black, black figures in, in English history, in, in the English archives. But she only had two images of one person. That was John Blank. Well, I had thousands of images, and I loved PowerPoint. I'd really, you know, she was quite jealous of my presentation, because they were really, you know, because the, these kings were dramatic characters. I can explain why they're dramatic. It's another, another story. But they were really powerful, good-looking characters. Where she had this, this humble but very precious portraits of uh, pictures of John Blank. So it was that sense that, I've got these hundreds of these black guys that didn't exist. And there's two of this guy who did exist. So then I thought, well, let's see if we can get artists to um, imagine John Blank, another version of John Blank. And then it seemed naturally to get historians involved. So that's, that's, that's how the project developed in terms of reimagining John Blank. And subsequent to that, it kind of, it became apparent that some people think it's in or inaccurate or inauthentic to have a black presence in Tudor times. So yes. it's sort of failure of their imagination, you know, so that, that, and that, that re-energized the project. And it's been going almost in its fifth year now. And we've got to tell you this, got to tell you this, got to tell you this. Friday this week, last week, we put up a plaque to John Blank in a blue plaque in Greenwich. The I Naval saw College that on Twitter. That's so exciting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's, you know, it was, it was, it was quite a humbling, emotional experience. You know, when you've lived with someone. Absolutely, so, like, someone, yeah. You exist, and then you actually put the plaque up to it. Really brilliant experience. So now it's um project's got momentum, but it's essentially but it's celebrating John Blank, a black figure who we have a, an image of, a very small image of, we know a little bit about from the record, and historians kind of and artists kind of recreate the big up the image. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And and so you said we know a little bit about him. So what do we know about his life? Well, the, the first the first thing we know, we, yeah, there was two images of him. He appears on this Westminster tournament role. And that, that, that that's the fundamental to his celebrity, you know, because yeah. pictures matter now, images matter. Yeah. That's what it's about. Now, one picture can go around the world, you know, but a, a paragraph <laughs> doesn't, doesn't fire anybody. Maybe a headline, yeah. but certainly the picture. We're in the picture as well as impact and power. So you've got those two pictures. And we know a little bit about him. He appears in the record about seven or eight times, quite fleetingly, being paid wages. And that's quite important in the sense that he wasn't a slave, because traditionally people think, well, black people in England slaves. It's more complex than that, more complex than that. They were not slaves. Perhaps we'll talk about it later on as we talk about the black presence in, in Tudor times. So we've got that presence there. We know he was paid wages. And he even had the audacity, if that's the right word, to ask for a wage increase because one of his um, 
what, 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 one of the trumpeters has died, Dominic. Uh, I don't come a year or so ago. And he said, "Look, I want, I want my wage to be doubled, to be paid the same as Dominic. If I'm to continue to do 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 the things you want me to do in the manner that you want me to do them." And with this, a, 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 an affirmative voice he's got, a kind of confident voice in this petition. Obviously, we don't believe he wrote the petition because we don't believe he could, he could write. Nevertheless, the, the core of the petition is clearly his words, and the scribe took them down and then had the confidence, jumped like the confidence, saying who. Who he was and what he wanted, and uh, the king signed it. You know, the send me the age signature on this document. And this is the ultimate micromanagement. But I guess that's the Tudor court for it, or the the megalomania that is Henry the Henry yes. Eighth in terms of his need to keep control of everything. Absolutely, and that does give a really interesting insight into John Blake, doesn't it, and into his personality and character. Just that little, you know, that little document. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we know he, he disappears from the record. He appears in 1507 when he's paid wages. The accounts in yeah. November 1507, and he disappears in January 1512 when he's given a bonnet and some cloth for his wedding again. And this is Henry signing, telling the, the great wardrobe to give this to him. Again, this micromanagement, total control of every little part of the, the, his estate. So he disappears. So he seems to be well thought of and well looked after. Seems to be quite a character. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned before Africa, the African population in 16th century England. I'd love to hear more about uh, what would life have been like for people of Black African descent living in Tudor England? Well, you know, when, when you gave me that question, you had to think about it. Why do I have to think about it? Because the lives we know about, they were, they were quite mundane. You know, they, they, they were... There was, a, there was a seamstress, there was a, a diver working for, for Drake, for uh, David the driver for Drake, there was, there was another a salvage diver. They were, they were doing just quite mundane jobs to the extent, and I, I want to turn it around, give, you, give it in a rather prosaic way. Miranda's done, the, has, has a book, Miranda Cavan book, Black Tudors. Um, that's been quite an influential book amongst teachers to bring the Black Tudors into uh, into the school, schools, in, into the curriculum. And one of the teachers, he did a whole a seminar on working class Black people. Work, no, work, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Like, working class people in Tudor times. And he didn't tell the, the children till the end of the course that they were Black. There was one was, uh, was a milkmaid. There was, a, there was another on, on the cow. There was another worked as say, the seamstress. These people doing jobs, so it seemed they were they were part of society, not you know, they, were, they weren't lords and kings, as I be well known, but they were there doing quite mundane things. The issue is how did they get here? Where did they come from? Because everybody in England's an island, everybody comes from somewhere. So and, and that's the intriguing thing, you know, did, did they come initially as slaves or in someone's entourage? And some did. We know that the Portuguese um, ambassador brought brought his his slave with him. So that's the inter- interesting part. But when they when they got here. They just kind of assimilated, the, they, they, they became part of society and they were all over the country, you know, from, from Penzance in, in the south up, up into Scotland. They're, they're recorded in, um, in the parish, many parish registers and many records. To the point, to the point one of the things I like to do when I ever go to a village I've not been to, I like to go into the church and see if I can find the black presence. You know, there's often is, because it, 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 it's there. It's, it's part, part of the fun of, we've got so many churches and there's a... Uh, being retired, you've got time on your hands to do these things. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And and so John Blank, did he come with Catherine of Aragon's entourage or is that still being <laughs> explored? Oh, that, okay. The short answer is we don't know. The long answer is it seems more than likely because she did bring some trumpeters with her and trumpeters were part of the ceremony of the court in terms yeah. of, you know, here comes the queen trumpets. There goes the queen trumpets. It was the punctuality, the punctuality, the punctuation, the punctuation of the courts in terms of in, in terms of the day. So it would be natural for it to have trumpeters and John Blank could well have been, because there's a, a traditional history of, of black trumpeters in the, the Spanish court, which dates back to the Islamic court. So yes. it, it, it all seems a good story, a good story. The problem is, let me bring it right up to date here. In the last month, they've discovered a 1488 John Blank footman right. okay now this is what, what's intriguing here intriguing here okay first it's spelled differently without an e because my the job my when i say my john blank i don't know <laughs> yes. I, feel, I feel as though i do it's spelled with with a, with an e and um, b-l-n-k-e this john blank 1488 is spelled without no no e and he's a footman a footman to henry the seventh so there's 1507 that, that's what my 
John, I yeah. say mine. You get, you get what I'm saying. You <laughs> get what my, you're saying, John. <laughs> my, the, my John Blank appears, and I've, I've been working with him, and you asked me where he came from. I, I've, I've given that backstory that we like to give him in Spain. But he could, he could have come from anywhere in Europe because the, there were black trumpeters throughout Europe, in France, in Spain, in Italy, even in Sweden. You know, there were black trumpeters, so he could have come from anywhere. He could have even been born here. Yeah. You know, so we don't really know the truth. But, then, but this 1488 John, John Blank really mixes it up because he, he was a footman. And the footman was quite a, a, a lowly job in court, in court, as I understand. And, but his job was to was literally the bodyguard for the uh, with the king and move with him and did, literally run alongside <laughs> his court. And I'm told this, the, they get a good a good footwear allowance because <laughs> they're always running out of boots. Yeah. So what we are right now is trying to, well, there's, 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 a, there's a bad joke coming. We're trying to fill in the blanks <laughs> between the 1488 John Blank and the 1507 John Blank. My problem is, and this is where you get emotional now, and this is where you, you shouldn't do this in history. I'm finding it hard to come to terms with that 1488 John Blank and my 1507 because I've got this backstory yeah. that gives them a, 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 a presence which doesn't fit. So I, I, I've got the one thing going to be the academic historian, and you, and you embrace this new finding. <laughs> And trying to fill in the blanks or the the, the pieces, but equally, the, the instinctively, well, no, this is my. <laughs> That's not my you John know. Blank. <laughs> it, 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 it's a watertight compartment, and, and there's there's a darker side to that. Some people who want to accept history's changing. They've got this. This is it. History is fixed, and yeah. we know history's. It's not fixed. It's. I love you know, Obama talks about. I use the word messy. It's messy. It's not. It's, it's not as beautiful as we want it to be. Not not as linear. Yeah. Not as perfect, you know, and, and great figures are flawed, you know. The, 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 we have to accept it in the round, and it's hard. We want it in the square and quite yeah. organized. And this is it does take an effort, but you, you know, one has to. So that we're, right now we're coming to terms with the, this fourteen eighty eight okay. John Blank. We're trying to. All right. Well, watch this space, I guess, and we'll see what else happens. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, that you've been studying Black presence in art of the period, and you mentioned a couple of depictions. Are there any others that you found? Oh, there's there's many, many. There's, uh, I don't want this to sound like a list of things. I'll just, I'll, I'll just give you some examples. Yes. There's always the most the most the most common one as a, as a servant, M- most times a slave. Yeah. With the black figures there supporting the uh, his master or his mistress. So you see them there, and you see the, all the great artists, Titian, Veronese, they, they would have a, a black presence in, in, their, in, in their portraits, many the portraits of elites. There's also, there's pictures of, um, of guards, of, of, of African guards. There's, you know, there's, there's one of uh, the, the rec- clearly recognisable as, as a, a guard to the Pope, because he's got that, that, uh, that pink and um, purple stripe that the Pope's guard had. This is a picture from about the 15th century. It's a black figure there as a guard to the Pope. As I say, we, we know the, there's musicians, they appear, there's, there's, a, there's several pictures of them, musicians, but not, not just John Blank, but other versions of John Blank playing instruments. What, what, one of my favorites I've just, I've just started reading about was well, from the Crusades. Now, there's, there's black figures in the Crusades, and, and then really, there's, there's two, one of the scene is the, the adversaries, the kind of the Moors took over the Holy Land. Briefly, there were Ethiopians, or there were black Ethiopians who were Christians, who were fighting on the side of the, the white Christians or the European Christians. Um, and th- th- that, that kind of leads into the Black St. Morris, because there's some, some historians argue that that's where he came from. The concept of the Black St. Morris came from the Crusades, uh, the Christians, the, the Black Christians that they met in the Crusades. So as I say, those are, those are a few of the images on, on top of the, the, the two principal ones, which are the Black King and St. Morris. Those, those, those are the two principal ones. So all the great artists, of the period, as the Titians, Botticelli, Veronese, Dürer, they all they all have a uh, black magus in their in, in their over and and often and some instance one or two um, ordinary black people like um, I mentioned um, I mentioned Dürer there, minded he's doing two beautiful little drawings of, of black figures. One we actually know who she is, Barbara, the uh, fifteen fifteen or something dates come from me, but that's from Antwerp. And that it just uh, the typical juror, he saw something he liked and yes, wanted, to, yeah. wanted to, 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 to recreate it. A really wonderful drawing. He's also got a drawing of a black man dated 1508. So some people doubt about 1508, but there's a black man. Again, we don't know who he is. It's just a drawing of a black man. And I, I have to see that as a kind of a, an intellectual exercise for the artist, you know, as Jura did. You know, he, he did one of my, Jura's did one of my favorite, favorite old time paintings called the, or the turf or the sod. You know, it's just a, some grass. 
Mm, I'd have to look it up now. <laughs> I'll write it down. Extraordinary. It is just the sod and the turf. Right. Wow. And he's painted this glass. And the intensity, the greens, the delicate shift in greens and sizes and thickness, it's just, it's an astonishing piece of work. I think, wow. Because for me, for that work, to my artist eyes are different because we, 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 see, we see a piece of grass and it all becomes grass, you know. You can see individual, it's like a self-portrait of individual blades of grass. And the color changes up the length of the, the, the blade of grass. It's just, it's true, it's, it's an astonishing piece of work. I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. No, no, that's good. Now I need to go and um, examine that. It's just a piece of, if you can imagine pulling up a piece of grass, yeah. roll the dirt wow. on it, okay. and then paint that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. And you were talking before about, obviously, imagination and art. Tell me a little bit more about the role that's played in this project and why it's so crucial. There was um, a podcast a couple of years ago, by um, a, a philosophy podcast, which featured uh, Martha Nussbaum, Professor Martha Nussbaum. She's an educationalist, and she explained to me why imagination matters. She was really talking about why humanities matter, why the humanities are important, because she was quite angry, because at the time, it was at the start of when humanity departments were being shut down, right. poetry departments, art departments, and we're seeing it today where they're, where they're cutting back on music in schools, when there's no money in this subject, you know, the STEM subject, science, technology, and so on, there's money in them, so we'll invest in them, but we're not going to invest in these, uh, these so-called soft subjects. She made the case for the humanities, and there's three points that she made, which, which, which have burnt it to my soul. The first is that the humanities is important because they give you a worldview. You look at the world differently. You walk in someone else's shoes. You look at the different religions, different philosophies, different languages, different ways of life, different worldviews. And in doing that, you question your worldview. You, you, you become critically aware. You, want, you interrogate your environment. You ask questions. Why? Now, sometimes you shouldn't ask questions because, you know, your mum said, I don't want to be going to smack, no, nothing like that. But that, that critical, <laughs> that, 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 that kind of um, critical curiosity, that's important. But then it has to be managed by your imagination. There's a dialogue there between the, you know, that questioning. So you're putting your critical thinking and your imagination to work together to see if it's true. We should talk about the arts and how great works of art are produced by that process, questioning your professional idea, like, Question again in terms of um, what, what, an, an approach to color, different forms of a color. So how how can we use this color to paint a human being? But the artist goes on that critical journey, yeah. asking questions and finding out their reality, creating a reality, and they stretch the critical thing and the imagination to create that work of art. As I say, my first degree was physics, and that was a I was obsessed with the, uh, the arts and sciences, two different planets. And I, I was I was I'm a new age man, bridging trying to bridge it through, but it was difficult. But no. I realized that science works on the same thing. You question your view, and, and then you go on a thought experiment. The one I like to think about is Einstein. He had the idea, what's it like to sit on a light wave? You know, so in his head, he was, I still find it hard to think about that. But, that, yeah. you know, he, he did some great discoveries in relativity and in working on these ideas. So that, that concept, questioning your worldview, so your critical thinking, your imagination, coming up with something. Now, that could be a new scientific theory. It could be a work of art. But that's where imagination is so important. It's, it's very dangerous. What well, well, I like to quote, I like to quote Einstein. I don't know if it, I have yet to find it, did he actually say this, but I believe it, you get, <laughs> help you get the sense of it. You know, logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will get you anywhere. Yeah. You know, that, that sense of thinking, that, that, that big thinking. So that, that, that's where the imagination comes to the project. And then the yeah. strap line is imagine the black to the trumpeter. Go on that journey, relax your mind and see, well, what, 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 what could it be like from what we know? So you ask, that's where the imagination comes into the, the project. Sorry for a long answer. To no, no, that's answer. great. And I saw some um, drawings that some school children did when that question was posed to them. And they were so fabulous. So, so fabulous. It, exactly, exactly. And, and kids have that, still got that. They're still yeah. imaginative. Whereas we close down, like I'm exactly. closing down about my 1488 John Blank. I mean, I can't have that. Whereas it's all, it's all possible. And, no. it's, uh, and it's so hard to relax your mind when you've got so, you know, you bring so much baggage to a situation. It is. It's so true. That is so true. And I know having explored the, the, the John Blank website, that there are lots of different historians and artists and different people that have contributed. So why are these collaborations so important and such an important part of this project? Well, for me, it's, it's, it's the art and archive. This is the art historian coming to me because art 
comes from the archives and the archives come from the art that makes sense. And makes me, I like the two working together, one proving the other. The, 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 this is not a fantasy. We're not making this up. There is some kind of reality. Let's go a little bit further. And I like the idea of, of a historian thinking about the work and then just stretching a little bit, going on that journey from the critical thinking, the imagination working, like his name, John Blank. Where did that come from? So, you know, then Paul Caplington some of an excellent piece that he talked about different forms of John Blank, France, in Italy, and in Spain. And here we have in England, how it was, it was a common name, what that means. But equally, you've got, there's a work by um, Onyeka, Naki Nubi, and he talks about, he looks forward to a time when John Blank will not be celebrated. It will be seen as, okay, there's a Black people That's in normal, yeah, so what? Yeah. Yeah. normalize it so the, the, the historians give us different views and then what, what the artists do they they, they they challenge us in terms of you know, with a visual challenge because some of the work some of it is quite challenging when i say challenge there's a couple of abstract pieces by some of the artists you think what's that but then this is that's part of you know, relax your mind have a look go into the work some of this one piece and just thinking that i hated it that's no, it's rubbish that you know it's mod because i'm not a big mod now i'm a figure i'm a I'm, I like Renaissance figures yeah, of art. You, know, <laughs> things you can recognize, you know, but I've lived with that for, for a year or two. And I've got, I've got into the piece because you can see what the artist is going, because, you know, everything is saying something, you know, because artists have got something in their head. They want to get into your head, you know, and, get, and, and, and it, it, it's working. So now that idea of getting artists and historians to imagine, to, to go on a little journey and then to help us when we look, read their work or look at the um, look at the work to try and understand a little better. One thing I'm particularly proud of, and this comes back to my Renaissance roots, is this: I've got a number of poems or poets who've done contributions. And what I love is the idea of you know as his po as his poetry as his art, because many of the Renaissance artists were struggling to be recognised yeah. as artists, because art was, was that was a, it was manual. It was seen they had, they added no value. Yeah. And this, you know, the tissue with his poesy, poesy, trying to create something from Ovid in, ter in, in terms of a painting, taking the literature and the poetry, making a painting out of it. So I like this idea of poetry and painting talking to each other. So there's poems written by the, um, reflect their version of John Blank. And you can look and read them against some of the, some of the work. So that the works talk to each other. So I think, I think for me, that, 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 that's a particularly important part of the, the project for me, this, this relationship between art and the poetry and art. And then we've even got a couple of rap artists that have done pieces of, of, from John Blank. Just, just on that subject of rap, and I'm, I'm going on a bit here, but one of the highlights of taking the project into schools, doing workshops, we did what, we get the kids to do, to, we take them through the John Blank, who John Blank was, and then we get them to do a painting or a drawing, and then make a statement, I imagine John Blank. Well, at one school, what the kids did was they, they got together and they got all their I imagine statements because they, each artist makes a statement I imagine John Blank has. And what the kids did, they did a little rap based on all the I imagine statements. And what was so frustrating, and we live in difficult times in terms of our children, I couldn't record it because I wasn't, you're not allowed to of record course, but yeah. share this information. And you have to get letters from everybody's mom. And then, so we lost the moment, oh. but it was, it was sticking in my mind. Those two, two little boys, three of them, do a little rap at the front of the class there. Because at, the the, at the end of the workshop, we have a little exhibition. Each so we come up with their work and I imagine job and they explain their work to the class. So it sounds was, brilliant. It sounds, well, I'm, a, I'm a primary school teacher myself, Michael, so I can totally imagine the three kids rapping because kids love to rap. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Yeah, and now you were, when you were talking about 1488 John Blank, is that connected to the recent discovery that Sean Cunningham's made or is that something different? No, no, that, that's exactly Sean Cunningham and, and, and the National Archive. He's done some work there. He did the way and he, he was kind enough to share it with me yes. <laughs> before he published it. And what, what was so that I first, again, don't believe that, hard to believe. So I wanted to share it amongst some of the, the historians on the project. And what's so annoying, they're all making the link. Yes, that's possible. Hmm, let's have a look at that. You know, I'm an outlier. I'm on my own here. I'm surrounded by people <laughs> looking into it. No, 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 it's good. It's, it's good. What we're going to do, we're going we're gonna, we're to have um, a seminar, a little uh, workshop, hopefully. It's, it's in the, the planning stage where Sean's going to produce a small paper and then we'll get people to, to comment on the paper and then we'll have a discussion. Some of the historians yeah. in the project to kind of trying to understand or imagine the 1488 Tudor footman, yes. <laughs> black Tudor footman in terms of, could he be John Blanks? So, that, that, so it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. It, hopefully it will grow. It's like, 
legs. And what I find particularly exciting about it, this is history in action in terms of, you know, having to literally rewrite history and not being afraid to do it. In terms of, yeah. and, and, and going into the record and saying, and just underline the fact, history is never complete. It's never finished. You know, there's always bits we, we don't know and they come to light and we just have to re- accept them. Yeah. yeah. I know, I I'm still finding that hard. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. No, so no, I'm really, I'm looking forward to, to do, uh, hearing more about that because I'm sure I'm doing some more work on footmen. Fantastic. And then the seventh footman to kind of position it in the, uh, in, in the archives in relation to John Blank. So I wanted to, to ask you, Michael, what's next with the projects? Obviously, that um, conference is something. Where do you hope to go, you know, to be sort of in the next few years with this? Well, th- this is going to be a career year for the project in terms of we're going to hopefully it's going to be an exhibition. I can't tell you. Right. I'm, I'm talking with them right now. It's a national, the national institution and a real institution. going to be a, a project which John Blank will be part of. That's going to happen hopefully in May. More details to follow. And to coincide with that, I'm going to do a book of the project, just put it all together. And I've got the idea, because this exhibition will, will only going to be part of this exhibition, will not be the exhibition. I want the, I always wanted the project to have an exhibition, a John Black exhibition. But this is, this, it's pretty close with the National Institute, that's, that's good. But I want, so I've decided I'm going to do this book, and I've got this vision for this art book. There's a book in the, on the great, great tournament role of Westminster that you can buy at the College of Arms for the same price that you could buy it in the 60s when you had retail price maintenance on books. This book was the price of a small car because color printing was really expensive and they used a really state-of-the-art color printing technique and there's gold, reds. It's a beautiful book and it's 30 pounds. And when I first saw this book, I, it was in, the, it's in the, the rare manuscript section of the British Library. And you have to be watched when you see, you, you, it's not it's on the list. You have to go to the desk and tell them you want it. And then they have to watch you looking at it. You can't, so, it was so, it was so precious. Because this is in the 60s, 30 pounds, that was the price of a small car. It's a beautiful book. Would you believe, do you know how much the book is worth? How much the book is today? 30 pounds. You can still buy in the college for 30 pounds. And it's a piece of history. Some of the printing techniques, it was very special. So I'm going to use that as the model for the book, for the, the John Bank Project book. So they'll, they'll, we can, they'll complement each other. So I'm looking, I'm, I'm not, right now I'm looking for a design work with a designer to design the book. So I want the book to be an object. Yes. You've got the historian's works, the poetry, the pictures, interleaved. So it's a, the, the book is an experience in its own right. That, that, that's my vision. So this year, the, apart from being on Talking Tudors, fantastic. That. <laughs> that's the highlight, come on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I want to be, I want to have this exhibition and the book. And then I, I'm gonna, I've, gotta, I've gotta say this, then stop. Cause you know, I wanna move on. I wanna move, <laughs> I would like to move on. No, not, not, you, can't, you can't have enough of John Blank, but you know, enough, done. The, yeah. the book will be a logical conclusion. That'll be the exhibition. Yes. So that, 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 that's it for John Blank. Well, it sounds like an amazing year ahead for you. And now, Michael, I can't let you run off just yet because at the end of episodes of Talking Tudors, what we do is what I call a little game of 10 to go. So just 10 questions to get to know you a little bit better. So the first one is, what is something you love about where you live? Well, I live in London and no, it's all here. <laughs> you know, you know, it's all here, but, it, but that's double-edged. Sometimes it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> you can get too much. But I love London with all the great institutions, the libraries, the galleries, you know, it, 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 it's just great. And I've got my freedom pass, you know, so I can just <laughs> pop in, pop into town and yeah. I get my concession now. So it's all, <laughs> it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? That's a great question. I really didn't know, you know, it was never on my, I just wanted to get to university. That was my <laughs> big thing. My, my yeah. education was very important to my mum and dad. And I just was on that train. I didn't have the, I just be, be educated the way they wanted yes. me to do. And I, I just worked of levels, A levels, university. Yeah. It wasn't until almost the last week of university, I started thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, was not, I was not a career person in the early yeah. days. And what about a book that you've read more than once? 
Oh, you've got me there. Oh, there's so many. Probably lots, I imagine. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm in a book club, in a book club now for over 25 oh. years. Wow, that's and, fantastic. And, uh, I haven't read any fiction books twice. I haven't. I've read yeah. technical. There's my art history books I've read many times, which are quite boring, but they're lovely. You know, I've got um, the, the text I read more than once regularly. I, was the, um, I got the image of the Black in Western art. It's a 12-volume book, and I've read that. Wow. Not cover to cover, but I've read that several, lots of times. To read a fiction book, that's a great question. No, because I've got so many other things I want to do. I'd like to read books no, twice. Like there's Angela's not a lot of time. Ashes, a few, you know, Frank Court's, Frank Lash, that's a lovely book. And what about, what's what would be an ideal Sunday morning for you? It would be breakfast in bed with a bottle of Prosecco with my partner. Oh, that sounds brilliant. I love that. We like that. And a proper breakfast, you know, we have bacon and egg with with the rockets and parmesan. We have a little special. And we watch a movie together. Just just That sounds very special. I love that. You sound like somebody who's, you know, enthusiastic about learning and a lifelong learner. So what's a, a new skill that you would like to learn? Wow, a new skill I'd like to learn. But my partner has just got into cold water swimming. Oh, yes. This is free free water swimming. This is Very swimming popular. in the sea. And, I, and I'm, I'd like to be able to do it. I'm going to get, to get there, but I just haven't got, you know, I, I'm <laughs> going to, I'd love to be, I'd like to, because I, oh, I would like to do it with her. Yeah. I'd like to try cold. I mean, it's just plucking up the courage to get in because it's so cold. Exactly. I know. <laughs> so oh. cold. Mike, what about the last film or movie or even series that you've watched? Well, funny you should say that. I'm not a great movie watcher. I have to, for me to watch a movie, I have to have great reviews. Must, it must, have, must, must be a purpose and it. it must have something yes. like that. It was last night. I watched um, To Serve It Love by Sidney Poitier. Oh, lovely. With Lou and, and it was, oh, it was, it was a great, great actor, Sidney Poitier. A lot of, lot of screen presence. But it just seemed... You know, the, the kids seemed so, it was 1960, I think it was 1950s, late, uh, late 50s, early 60s, it seemed so dated, but lovely, it's a little time capsule, it was, it was, it was really nice, I enjoyed that very much. Wonderful, and do you have any pets? No, no, no. <laughs> or you don't like them, or you don't? <laughs> yes, yes, no, no, I'm not a great dog or a cat person, yeah. you know, I respect them, I, I, you know, I'm, I admire your cat, your dog. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it outside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, you probably think less of me now. No, not at, not at all. Not at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> and if now you could instantaneously visit any country in the world, where would you like to go? I was in international sales and I visited probably all. I'm, oh. I'm, I've never been to South America, been everywhere else, even been to Australia. To be honest with you, I'm through traveling now. Yeah. I've seen yeah. enough. I just like, as long as I've got my internet, I, I'd like to go. When I've got a high speed internet and lots of sun, and there's a little island, an island in, in the West in the West Indies, Karaku. It's one of the great, one of the three Grenadian islands. It's a little small island, population 6,000. Paradise Beach, little house on Paradise Beach. And with me and Abu, that would be just. Perfect. That sounds beautiful. Yeah, that sounds like a dream. And what about your favourite, maybe you've got more than one, but genre of music? What do you like to listen to? That, that, I was going to say, that, that, I like all kinds of music. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I like um, I, I, I like rock music from, from the 70s. Like this, this is the David Bowie, Doobie Brothers, the Allman Brothers. That's my very, very favourite music. And then I've got, obviously, there's, there's obviously this Tamla Motown and soul music. Really. Yeah. I like that. But that, 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 that music, when I was at university, seven, 71 to 74, I was listening, listening to something. It always makes me smile. Lots Brings of back memories, memories hey? Yeah. yeah. And you look far too young. Imagine far too young. To <laughs> oh, thank, thank you very much. You just earned brownie points for yourself. <laughs> and lucky last question. Uh, what would you like to see more of in the world? So I'm going to give you my mum's answer. Love, peace and understanding. Oh, your mum's absolutely correct, isn't she? No, I love peace and understanding. I was sort of like, just more, you know, and, and seriously, you know, this pandemic, doesn't it prove that we're all humans? Absolutely, yeah. That, you know, forget all, you know, all that nonsense, of, you know, about I've got more money, I live in a bigger house. We're humans, man. So just respect each other. And, you know, we've all got backstories, we've all got families. You know, that's why we, but we feel for some of the, some of the stories that come from the pandemic, well, you know, that common humanity. Yeah. That we all have and when you see and it, it just amazes me when, when i turn on the news and in london people are wearing masks then they go to chile you know there's 
people are wearing masks. Nigeria, people yeah. are wearing masks. <laughs> There's something going on. Yes. <laughs> it's connecting us. Yeah. You know, and if we recognize our common humanity, but, you know, it's, uh, oh, we're, not, we're a long way from, we're all building yeah. borders and yeah. restricting progress and all that stuff. It's just Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And one very last thing I promise, and that is what I call a Tudor takeaway. So this is basically just something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. Sometimes people suggest websites, songs to listen to, books to read. Do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? When I first saw that question, oh my goodness, no, just John Blank, but no, really no. <laughs> it's um, it's 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 Catalina de Montreal. Catalina Mon- Montreal. She was the black chambermaid to Catherine of Aragon, and she would have been there the night that the, the she would have prepared the bed for Arthur Henry's brother and Catherine to do their business on their wedding night. Yes, and she wow. would have known if the, if the marriage had been consummated. Yeah. she would have took the sheets away now. She left the court, and later when he was trying to marry Anne Boleyn, he wanted to divorce Catherine. He said the marriage was consummated, so it would be the the, the marriage was illegal in the Catholic Church, because if the marriage hadn't been consummated, then it was okay for him to marry his brother's wife. The Bible says that. But if the marriage had been consummated, then that means the marriage was illegal. And would have, the, the divorce was possible. So they went looking for Catalina. They never found her. But imagine if they had found her. Oh, gosh, thank goodness that they didn't <laughs> find her. I, you know, what would he have done? So, oh. so it, 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 there's a, a beautiful um, uh, web page about it on the Hampton Court website. So I'll, I'll send you the link. Yes, if you Google, If you Google yep. Catalina and Hampton Court, you'll find a website. You'll, you'll see her story. The Black Chamber made to Catherine of Aragon. Thank you. That's a wonderful takeaway. And I'll put the link to, to that on the show notes. And of course, I'll put the link to the John Blank project so that everyone can go and have a look at that as well. That is wonderful. And Michael, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for talking to tutors with us. No, well, thank you. It's been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great to share my passion because it's not often I get the ability to talk at length. I hope, I hope I'm going too, far, too long, but I've very much enjoyed it. You've been, you've been, a, you've been a great question. As I say, you asked such great open questions. Very, very, very much enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.